people have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect. Subscribe Tag TV YouTube channel and press the notification button. I'm your host Uzma Jafri with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show. As second COVID wave grips parts of India and authorities scramble to counter it and prevent further infections, New Delhi has pushed for fastest acceleration in what is already the world's biggest vaccination drive. Millions turned up on day one of the latest phase where everybody above 45 years is now eligible for inoculation. As many as 3.6 million Indians received vaccine jabs on 1st April after New Delhi expanded its inoculation drive to counter the resurge of infections in the country. The world's second most populous country aims to immunize 400 million people after expanding the program which had been restricted to the over 60s and people with serious health conditions. India kicked off its inoculation drive in January that focused on health workers and security personnel in the first phase, followed by elderly, saying it wanted to cover the most vulnerable first. And while the number of daily COVID infections had come down to fewer than 10,000 cases a day last month, a sudden spike in some parts following the resumption of nearly entire economy has added a pressure on the government. Some parts of the country have already announced partial lockdowns, others are mulling it too. The government's priority has been to save lives against economic losses. While it has asked the citizen to get themselves vaccinated, testing has been ramped up and vaccine manufacturers have been asked to double down on producing more jabs. Assertive citizens have made things easy for the administration. Meanwhile, the authorities have urged the people to not put their guard down and continue to comply with the COVID protocol. Prime Minister Narendra Modi himself had asked people to not get complacent with earlier gains made by the country. We have to the second peak तुरंत रोकना ही होगा और इसके लिए हमें क्विक और डिसाइसिव कदम उठाने होंगे Although the second wave is increasing the number of cases exponentially India which is no more the second worst affected country owing to its successful preventive run for weeks until last month still has one of the best recovery rates of around 95% India's mortality rate too is amongst the lowest in the world and with vaccine manufacturing companies set to expand their production, the country will be more equipped to counter and control the disease. And it's not just that India has been working for Indians, its vaccine mastery drive aimed at providing vaccines to others, needy countries, has picked momentum with dozens of countries inoculating its citizens with India-made vaccines. Moving on. A consistently inconsistent political process aimed at restoring peace in war on Afghanistan has still not been able to come up with something concrete. New components and propositions are not adding up to anything remarkable. Talks destinations are changing, but not the Afghan destiny.
Meanwhile, New Delhi has struck the right note by emphasizing the need of ensuring peace in the region in order to see Afghanistan peaceful. At the ninth Heart of Asia Ministerial Summit in Tajik capital of Dushanbe, India, in a veiled reference to Pakistan's continued support to terrorism and non-state actors, urged the stakeholders to endeavor in directions of achieving regional peace. The Ninth Heart of Asia Summit, aimed at promoting peace and security in Afghanistan, came at a sensitive time as the United States and other powers attempt to jumpstart the peace process with a proposal for a new transitional government. While all participating nations joined in the chorus singing Peace for Afghanistan, Indian External Affairs Minister Subramanyam Jay Shankar was unambiguously on the target. He urged nations to ensure peace in the entire region in order to have calm in Afghanistan. His statement came in the backdrop of a rising number of Pak Bak terrorist infiltrations in India and continued covert support of Pakistan establishment to the Taliban. Oh, in Afghanistan, what we need is a genuine double peace, that is peace within Afghanistan and peace around Afghanistan. It requires harmonizing the interests of all, both within and around that country. If the peace process is to be successful, then it is necessary to ensure that the negotiating parties continue to engage in good faith with a serious commitment towards reaching a political solution. Despite peace being pursued by both opposing sides in Afghanistan, the violence spiked sharply last year. The number of violent incidents went up by 45% in 2020 to their corresponding months in 2019. Kabul establishment has accused Islamabad of providing man, material and logistic support to Taliban. Pakistan denies the charge, but analysts agree to a large extent. Meanwhile, Afghan President Ashraf Ghani has said that he is ready to get down if an election is held for a new government. He said he wants to see a better Afghanistan and do not want to cling on to power, but a process has to be followed. Envision, envision three phases to this passage. Making, building and sustaining peace. Focused on achieving the agreed-upon end state of a sovereign, democratic, united, neutral, and connected Afghanistan. The United States has drafted a peace plan calling for the current Afghan government to be replaced with an interim administration until a new constitution is agreed and elections held. All stakeholders had agreed to accelerate the peace process in the recently held summit in the Russian capital, Moscow, but things are appearing to hit another roadblock as Ghani is not ready for transitional government without elections. The next meeting of regional players is scheduled in Turkey, but any remarkable development appears unlikely. Meanwhile, Afghanistan said that New Delhi holds a very significant value to the Afghan peace process and looked forward to its continued presence all along. India is, uh, is an important partner to Afghanistan and given its, its significance is, is a major power in the region, we want India to be part of all those foras and those talks where peace is discussed. India has stakes in Afghanistan. The peace of Afghanistan impacts India as well. So India has adopted a very principled position to supporting uh, uh, Afghan peace process in, in a just and fair way. So, and, and we would want India's presence in those forums. India has been one of those important neighbors and allies of Afghanistan in which it has expressed trust and confidence over the years. From hosting Istanbul peace process to developing Afghan infrastructure, Indian commitment towards Afghan peace has reflected in its unwavering pro-Afghan endeavors. 
The international community, including the United States, has acknowledged the importance of New Delhi in carrying the process forward, as Washington recently said that India must be included in all steps of the peace process. Moving on. Ethnic Baloch, a minority in Pakistan that has been demanding independence from the clutches of Islamabad, has upped the ante by expanding its movement both domestically and internationally. A large number of them gathered and demonstrated in different European and East Asian cities to register their decades of frustration. They highlighted the illegal occupation of their land and Pakistan's human rights violations. Activists from the Baloch National Movement, along with common persecuted Balochs, took to streets of different global towns and demonstrated against Pakistan establishment. A number of Baloch women and children joined the pro-freedom protest in Hanover in Germany to mark March 27 as Black Day when the Pakistan Army in 1948 forcibly occupied Balochistan. They blame the Pakistan army, which operates with impunity in the region, has been committing genocide of innocent Baloch people. This day, 1948, Pakistan have occupied uh, Balochistan with uh, power and force. And today, after uh, almost a century, still the people are struggling and fighting back for the freedom of Balochistan. Unfortunately, this is not only an occupation, but it also have resulted now uh, as a genocide, as a genocide of Baloch nation. And we appeal to the to the human rights defenders and other nations to protect Balochistan, save Balochistan. Baloch activists have made repeated pleas before the world. They want the international community to take note of the massive human rights violations being carried out at the commands of the Pakistan Army. Over the years, they have lodged several complaints with the United Nations and have held various protests around different cities of the world. But all their requests and petitions seem to have fallen on deaf ears with little or no reaction coming out of the international community. In the past few years alone, hundreds of locals have been killed and thousands of others have vanished without a trace. Activists accuse the army of attacking and violating women in order to rein in the dissenting men of the region. Balots, however, say that they will not back down until the freedom is ensured. Activists say they will go around the world to expose Pakistan and its nefarious designs. We want to kill the war and the Pakistani security forces and the state of the Pakistan that Baloch nation will keep fighting and keep their struggle for the free and sovereign Balochistan. And until unless we continue our this struggle, then we are not going to achieve our goal of freedom. Balochistan has huge gas and mineral reserves and contributes a large share to Pakistan's revenue but doesn't receive corresponding appreciation in return. Those who demand their rights are systematically targeted by state forces. The government takes extrajudicial measures to stifle their voices. They are subject to police high-handedness and imprisoned in Comunicado. An additional component of China-Pakistan economic corridor has further worsened their lives with Islamabad intensifying its operations at the directions of Beijing. Baloch say in such a scenario it is not their determination to resist till eternity that matters, but only a unified international approach can save them from the ultimate catastrophe. And now, in the fresh edition of Asia This Week, we will show you some stories from the Asian continent that made news. People across the Southeast Asian nation of Myanmar have intensified their demonstration as the military junta continues to hold the power it grabbed 
undemocratically on 1st February this year. People are demanding immediate release of civilian leader Aung San Suu Kyi and the restoration of democracy, which the country had obtained in 2011 after nearly five decades of military rule. The military rule and consequent violence has drawn strong criticism from the international community, including the US president, but that hasn't proven enough. It's terrible. It's absolutely outrageous. An awful lot of people have been killed totally unnecessarily. At least 520 civilians have been killed in nearly two months of opposition and disturbing scenes continue to emerge from the country despite some of the demonstrators resorting to peaceful protests. Meanwhile, 2,000 refugees fleeing Myanmar to Thailand were reportedly pushed back despite the ongoing aerial bombardment. Thai authorities, however, have rejected the claim and said that their army was taking care of them on the border. In a unanimous decision, the Chinese parliament adopted a controversial electoral plan for Hong Kong that critics say will eradicate even the bare minimum democracy in the city. Referred as Patriot Plan, Beijing says the aim is to keep the unpatriotic figures away from the political positions. Basically, it returns Hong Kong back to 1997 or before 1997. Uh, those uh, election reforms that is made uh, in the past 20 odd years were all gone and that is not good for Hong Kong because in the past we know that uh, the major problems that we are facing is not just about housing or not just about whether or not the young people can get the social mobility. It is about whether the system can actually reflect what Hong Kong people think. The move that has come in line with Beijing's attempts to tighten its control over the city has also diluted the influence of members of parliament. While overall seats will increase from 70 to 90, the number of directly elected representatives will fall from 35 to 20. Hong Kong used to be under British control but was handed back to China in 1997 under a one country, two systems principle. Certain freedoms were guaranteed to the people of the city, but Beijing is accused of muzzling them through different tactics. Japanese company Nisei has introduced a light yellow colored, soft serve ice cream to tickle the taste buds of its customers with sophisticated sweetness and memorize them the traditional sweet culture of Japan. Funawa is a traditional Japanese sweet shop located in Asakusa, Tokyo, was supported by Nisei to develop this ice cream, which is known as Imo Yokan. It is made up of sweet potato and sugar which is first converted into a paste and then mixed with vanilla ice cream. Funawa is practicing all the precautionary measures against COVID-19 to enable its customers to have a safe and delectable experience. また着色料を使用していないため色味が薄くなってしまうと問題に直面いたしましたが私工作後重ねていく中で現在の芋洋館ソフトクリームが完成いたしました。さつまいも本来の甘さを堪能できるソフトクリームとなっております。the natural taste of sweet potato and cute appearance have also gained a reputation on SNS. This conglomeration of traditional sweet emo yokan and modern sweet soft ice cream has offered a new style of sweets to foreign tourists.
V-based Kyoto, produced by Raesam, is a hostel in the central town of Kyoto, which offers simple affordable accommodation and targets the young travellers around the world. Hostel staff speak several languages and offers special hospitality services which are not common in all hostels. In order to develop better communication with people from other countries, various events are organized. One among them is Japanese traditional music, Taiko experience class, in which foreign students and local people are invited. Another one is a cooking class in which guests learn to cook Chinese and Korean traditional dishes with the help of a teacher who is also a member of the hostel staff. お客様の楽しかったよっていうお声と笑顔を見ることができて本当私たちも明日からのモチベーションをいただきました。たくさんの国からのお客様をお迎えしたいと私たちも張り切って準備をしております。地元の方とあと旅行者をつないでいきたい